Convolutional neural networks are especially used to process images. Images, as they are fed into a computer, and even as they first track the retina, are two-dimensional. Each pixel is located in a grid of two dimensions. However, if you remember, our standard neural networks process information layer by layer, and each layer is a one-dimensional array of values. So for an image to be suitable input and for it to be processed by our network, we have to do some serious reformatting. We have to flatten a two-dimensional array into a one-dimensional one. So for instance, if you have an image with 16 pixels arranged in four rows and four columns, you have to squeeze it into a vector of 16 pixels. However, when you flatten your image in this way, you also lose information. For example, you lose sight of the fact that pixel 5 is immediately to the right of pixel 1. So in reformatting images to input them into a conventional network, we lose information. Moreover, remember that our traditional neural networks are fully connected, which means that every unit from one layer is connected to every unit from the next layer. If we go back to our previous image, we see that it contains 784 pixels arranged in 28 columns and 28 rows. The last column and row each say 27 because our count starts with zero. So once we flatten this image and pipe it into our dense, fully connected layer, we're going to need 785 parameters per unit. That is, 784 weights for each of the pixels plus the unit's bias. Now, know that this image has very low resolution, right, of 28 by 28. However, a 200 by 200 pixel image would not be considered very big. Moreover, this image is black and white, and so we need only one channel. Whereas if we had a full color RGB image, then we would need three separate channels, a red one, a green one, and a blue one. In such a case, we would have, again, three channels, each with 40,000 pixels, corresponding to a total of 120,001 parameters per unit in a dense or fully connected layer. So if we had a modest number of units in our dense layer, let's say 64, then we would end up with nearly 8 million parameters associated with the first hidden layer alone. Also, notice that 200 by 200 pixels is barely 0.4 megapixels, whereas most smartphones have sensors of 12 megapixels or more. In short, plugging moderately sized images into a fully connected network will result in very, very heavy computational demands. Finally, let me remind you of the problem of recognizing the same category of object in different conditions, say whether it has been moved or rotated where it may have a very dissimilar appearance. This is the problem of achieving translational invariance. In short, when feeding image data into a fully connected network, we face problems such as loss of information and computational cost, which makes these networks less than ideal for visual processing. Furthermore, we would like to achieve translation invariance in order to get a more robust object recognition system. Convolutional neural networks are intended to solve these problems and meet this aspiration. A convolutional neural network, also called ComNet or CNN, is an artificial neural network that has one or more convolutional layers. This layer type allows for better and more efficient processing of spatial patterns, such as those involved in computer vision. Convolutional layers are composed of a series of kernels, also called filters. These kernels or filters make use of two ideas local receptive fields, and shared weights. If you remember, visual cells do not respond indiscriminately to the whole field of vision, but are only attuned to a specific area, which is called its receptive field. Analogously, an artificial neuron in a convolutional layer is not connected to all the units in the previous layer, say the input layer. Rather, they are only connected to a subset of them, and this subset is its local receptive field. You can see it as a little window superimposed on the input layer. All the receptive fields of a given layer have the same size, 5 by 5 in this specific example, and they all feature the same set of weights. The receptive fields of neighboring hidden units overlap to a certain extent, and for each local receptive field, there is a different hidden neuron in the first hidden layer. So if we survey the receptive fields of the units in the hidden layer, going from left to right and from top to bottom, it is as if we were using a window to scan across the image, like this if your image were a drawing of a cat. Another characteristic of convolutional neural networks is that all the units in a convolutional layer share their weights. For the sake of this example, suppose that instead of having 
five by five kernels, we have a layer with three by three ones. In a convolutional la layer, not only will all the receptive fields be of the same size, but the units corresponding to them will also have exactly the same weights. By examining the weights, you can see that the unit will be activated when there is a thin, pixel-wide vertical line to the left in the form of lighted pixels, and that it will be inhibited if the line is thicker and extends to the right. In short, you can see these units as detecting vertical edges throughout the whole image. Notice that these units of convolutional layers exhibit the property of orientation selectivity, the same property that we saw in the simple cells of the primary visual cortex. It is useful to apply the same feature detector everywhere in the image. This allows convolutional networks to achieve translation invariance of images. So if you change the picture of a house a little bit, it is still the picture of a house. The shear weights and bias are said to define a kernel or filter. So suppose that our network's task is to detect the presence of dogs. Then we begin with a black and white input image. Here we are highlighting the receptive fields of two hidden units, each of which is shown as a white square in the image. Each of these receptive fields will include nine pixels, and each of these pixels will contain a value which corresponds to the darkness or lightness of the pixel in question. The values range from zero to 255, and the lighter the pixel, the higher the value. So you can see that the unit at the top has some light pixels to the left, which, as you can see, correspond to the dog's fur, whereas the receptive field of the bottom unit is more uniformly dark, since there is only grass in that area. Then, as we slide the window from side to side, each unit in the layer will calculate an activation value that measures the degree to which its receptive field matches the unit's preferred edge orientation, which in this case it's vertical. The units do that by applying our old friend the weighted sum equation. So they proceed for each pixel in the receptive field to multiply its value times the weight associated with the position. This operation is called convolution. The calculation would go as shown here. You can see that the sum for the top unit is 410, whereas that for the bottom unit is minus 10, and that this agrees with the fact that the top receptive field contains a contour where a column of light pixels is juxtaposed to a column of dark pixels, right where the dog's fur ends and the grass begins, and this forms an edge. In the bottom field, however, there are no such contours, so the total input is close to zero. For simplicity's sake, I've ignored the bias term, which, of course, is the same for all units. Also, the resulting weighted sums will be passed through an activation function, such as sigmoid or ReLU, though the last one is much more common in convolutional networks. So basically, the convolutional layer scans the image looking for a particular feature, again, in this case, vertical lines. The outcome is a map of where in the image we can find the feature that we are looking for. We can call this a feature map or activation map. Here we have the resulting map of vertical edges. A given layer typically will produce different maps, each of which is devoted to a different feature and will have a different kernel. For instance, map 2 indicates the presence of horizontal edges, and map 3 marks slanted ones. Taken together, these three maps provide the network with a representation of the input image in terms of oriented edges on different regions. The first layer is not the only one containing maps. The maps on layer 2 serve as input for those in layer 3 which themselves constitute the input for layer 4. So in this hypothetical network, layer 2 units perhaps will be sensitive to combinations of edges, such as T-junctures or corners, whereas those in level 3 will respond to combinations of combinations of edges, and so on, in a way that is reminiscent of the hierarchical way in which visual representations are formed in the mammalian brain. So once we are in layer 4, we already have a map for complex features, and at this time we send those as input to what we can call a classification module. This classification module is itself a traditional, fully connected network, which takes layer 4 representations as input and outputs a percentage for each of the categories that the machine is working with. So both of the available categories are cat and dog. This represents how confident the network is that the input image corresponds to the category in question. In this case, the network is 80% sure that the input image is one of a dog. So the category with the highest confidence is taken to be the outcome of the network classification. So in this example, the outcome is a somewhat confident vote for dog. A confnet also has other components, such as pooling layers, which prevent the network from overfitting and also reduce computational complexity. But we won't discuss those here. Confnets are also trained by gradient descent and backpropagation over many epochs. 
The weights of the kernels are not pre-specified by the network's designers, but when trained on large enough sets of data, they seem to learn a hierarchy of detectors similar to what we find in the visual system of the brain. In short, a component takes an input image and transforms it via convolutions into a set of feature maps with increasingly complex features. The features at the highest convolutional layer are fed into a traditional neural network. This network outputs confidence percentages for the categories the network is working with. The category with the highest confidence is returned as the network's classification of the image. Finally, what are some of the main characteristics of confidence? First, they have sparse connectivity, as opposed to the full connectivity of standard networks. Second, they have shared weights, since all the units in a particular map of a hidden convolutional layer share the same kernel, and thus share the same configuration of weights and biases. Third, and as a consequence of the two previous characteristics, a confnet is able to recognize an object across changes in position, lightning, and other variables. If you want to see a well-trained confnet in action, simply take a picture of an object and upload it to Google's search by image engine. Google will then try to classify your image out of thousands of categories, and then it will return its best guess for the image. Confnets are just one example among many kinds of deep networks. They are a technological triumph, and a good example of how breakthroughs can happen when one looks outside of one's discipline. It is also true that confidence have equaled and even surpassed human performance in some tasks, though generally these sorts of claims need to be taken with a grain of salt. I regret not having time to discuss this issue here. However, a cognitive scientist is typically concerned with natural minds, and one source of interest in neural networks is their role as models of human cognition. This was, after all, the initial interest of connectionists, as you'll remember. So how relevant are convolutional networks and other deep networks for cognitive science? How accurate are they as models of human cognition? Some authors have complained that there are important differences between the way in which deep networks process information and learn and the way in which animals, including humans, do it. There have been many complaints, but I'm only going to mention two. So it has been said that deep networks require far more training data than animals for the purpose of learning the same task. Just remember the huge size of the datasets used for training convnets like AlexNet. On the other hand, animals, including humans, can sometimes exhibit robust learning from just a handful of examples. And we sometimes require just one episode, as when we learn somebody's name or the location of our car in the parking lot. Also, there are cases in which what is learned by a network in a given task is very different from what is learned by a human in the same task. A dramatic example of this is provided by so-called adversarial examples. These are images created by slightly modifying a picture in a way that is imperceptible to humans, but which could cause dramatic misclassification by a neural network. Here you have a set of adversarial examples. There are four pairs of images. One member of the pair was correctly classified by a network, and the other member was slightly but crucially modified in such a way that the network got confused and misclassified it. Can you tell which is which? No? Okay, neither can I. In fact, each of the members of each pair is, in the eyes of humans, indistinguishable from the other. Nonetheless, for each of the cases, the network misclassifies the right member as an ostrich. This is a sort of error that is unfathomable to humans and seems to indicate that the network has no idea what's going on and that, despite being otherwise very successful in classifying images as ostriches, it has no conception of what an ostrich is. Of course, deep learning proponents have responses to these concerns, but these are outside the scope of this video lecture. Cheers. Mm -hmm.